Members, it is now time for questions to the Executive Office, and I call David Hillage to ask the first question. Mr. Hillage, and I call the Deputy First Minister. I call the Deputy First Minister. Thanks to the member for his question. We have taken a multifaceted approach to dealing with matters associated with the protocol so that we can respond effectively to any issues as we become aware of them. We are closely engaging with the British Government at both ministerial and official level to deal with the impacts that our businesses citizens are, and citizens are currently facing. This engagement has included daily ministerial attendance along with Scotland and Wales at the XO Exit Operations um, Cabinet Committee, where we have taken the opportunity to highlight the significant issues that we are dealing with and to press for rapid solutions. In parallel to that, we are continuing to engage closely with our business community to ensure that their issues um, are addressed and to work together to seek resolutions. We have also been engaging closely with the Irish Government, particularly on the delays that hauliers are experiencing on the Hollyhead to Dublin route, and we will continue to seek solutions to issues as they arise and to engage with the British Government to ensure timely planning for the end of grace periods. David Hilly, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, will the Deputy First Minister agree or acknowledge that the rush to get the rigorous implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol and the amendments inserted in the Belfast Agreement by the Secretary of State have breached the Belfast Agreement on cross community consent and the protections? Uh, well, firstly, um, I don't agree, no, um, certainly not. I, mean, I think the protocol gives us um, protections which we weren't afforded um, throughout the whole of the Brexit debate. So our job as an executive is to ensure the rigorous implementation of the protocol and we'll continue to work with, uh, with both the Irish Government, with the British Government, with the EU side in terms of any issues that we see uh, in terms of the, that are problematic. But as we know, and this is my own political opinion, as we know Brexit, um, there isn't anything good to come from Brexit and the problems that we foresee that, we, that were foreseen then are now coming to life. Um, however, our job as an, ex as an executive is to make sure that we minimise any disruption, uh, will be that uh, north, south, or east, or west, and we work to find solutions to a number of the issues that have been identified in these early days. I call Jim Allister. Having demanded and voted for the rigorous implementation of the protocol, and indeed told us today that the executive wants the rigorous implementation of the protocol, it's pretty clear to me that the Deputy First Minister cares little for the resulting damage to our businesses and consumers. So, so could I ask, what does she say to people like Beth Lunny, Robin Mercer, who are trying to run garden centres and have been told by their GB suppliers that they can't bring in roses or azaleas because there might be soil on or in the pots because the protocol ludicrously imposes an EU ban on the importing of soil. Surely, if the, prime, if the Deputy asked. First members Minister declared asked. anything for business, she would be members concerned about seat, that. Member resume his seat. The member should be mindful whenever you ask a question, you ask a question without a long introduction, and then you finish when you ask your first question. Thank you. I think perhaps the member should explain to his constituents that he himself endorsed Brexit, voted for Brexit and championed Brexit, and these were always going to be the implications. But let me say to your constituents in terms of the issue, in terms of soil, that we are aware of this issue in relation to the movement of soil from Britain to here, and we're also liaising with DERA on this issue and hope to try and find a resolution. I call Matthew Toole. Uh, speaker, um, all of the issues to do with east-west trade, uh, along with the issues we face in north-south, are a product of Brexit. The protocol is a product of Brexit. Just specifically, briefly, in relation to soil, the island of Ireland shares soil. The UK has chosen to leave the EU SPS zone. It is a direct consequence of that decision that means that there is no plausible way. It's not a nationalist or remainer plot to have us in the same SPS sorry, zone could in the member, island of Ireland. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Could Speaker. The but member I, asked the question that you have tabled and you've been called to ask. We don't need to answer anybody else's okay. question. Asked, very, very briefly, Mr. Speaker, the, point, the, the question I want to ask is, has the Executive Office 
uh, understanding the limitations that Brexit places on our trade, has the Executive Office commissioned InvestNI, Intertrade Ireland and others to urgently develop a strategy for maximising the benefits of Northern Ireland's dual market access into both the UK and EU markets? That's something we should all be able to agree on. What is the Executive Office doing to maximise the benefits to b- businesses here from investment from the, both the EU and GB into this market and this economy? Just again, thanks to the, to the member for his questions, and I, and I concur with um, a lot of the commentary that's been made there. I think that we are very early days in terms of um, being post uh, the 31st of December, so obviously there are a lot of issues to be worked through. Um, there are a number of current issues, whether that be soil or the issue of seed potatoes, fisheries, eels, steel. Um, there's a raft of things that need to find uh, that we need to find resolution to, and we will work with. Uh, those who are appropriate in order to try to find resolutions to those things uh, where we can. In terms of the future, then we have to look about um, econo- the, the economy in a post-Brexit era. What does that look like? Um, certainly, um, as an executive, and certainly the Department of the Economy will have to come forward with um, economic strategy around where is our target markets, where, where can we look to for the future, and how can we build a very strong economy? Nicole Martina Anderson. Um, I'm sure the First Minister will agree that the problems we are facing has got to do with the Brexit that the majority of people here in the North didn't vote for. So does the Joint First Minister agree that the lateness um, that, um, of the advice that was given to British businesses, coupled with a lack of preparation by the British Government, has resulted in the problems that we are facing and businesses are facing today? Again, just uh, to say that you know, there's no doubt that the businesses here um, have been quite well prepared for the changes, and it's very, also very clear um, from all the engagements that we've done as an executive office, even with the business community, um, that there is a lack of similar preparedness among businesses in England and indeed in Scotland and in Wales to comply with the new processes for sending goods here. We've been raising this issue um, directly with the British government and encouraged them to do more to make sure that there's a better state of preparedness from their businesses. The disruption at the, at the short straits before Christmas due to the requirements for hauliers to have a negative COVID-19 test before entering France also had a knock-on effect on the supply chain and that also led to some delays. Um, however, I am glad to say the stock levels have now stabilised with only a few product brands that are now not available to consumers here. Fulfilment of food deliveries to the major retailer stores has risen to 85 per cent compared to 65 per cent at the beginning of the year. Groupage or the transport of mixed loads in a single lorry has proven to be a major issue for our hauliers who operate to tight margins and, and also to tight, very tight turnaround times. It also affects smaller companies who are not benefiting from the grace periods from supermarkets. This issue has been raised on a regular basis at ministerial and official level and I understand also that DERA in liaison with um, DERA and the industry are working, or DEFRA and the industry are working to identify options to address um, these issues and that hopefully there will be a resolution shortly. Moving on, I call Paula Bradley. Question two. Uh, can call you with your permission, I'll answer questions two, four and eight together. The executive's response to the COVID-19 pandemic continues to be led by the latest medical and scientific advice. Our decisions have been informed by the health and well-being of our citizens, the economic impacts of any interventions and our societal and community well-being. Any decisions on the executive's next steps are informed by the impact they may have on us all as individuals, as families, and the wider community within which we all live. The executive has established a COVID-19 task force to lead and to coordinate an integrated programme of work of response to and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The task force has initially structured its work under four work streams, protect, recovery, adherence, and strategic communications. Since the current regulations were put in place on the 26th of December, we have been encouraged that the majority of people are adhering to them and that they are doing their utmost to help limit the spread of COVID-19. This can be clearly seen in the failing uh, and the falling R numbers and the reduction in the number of positive cases. However, pressure on our hospitals will remain for some time and as such we cannot be complacent. The Executive's work, our task force is also looking at ways of further increasing adherence to the public health regulations and guidance, which includes providing input into the design of any restrictions proposed. Clearly, we would like everyone to continue to play their part in following the public health guidance. However, there are blatant breaches of the regulations. The PSNI and local government will ensure enforcement activity is rigorous. 
Recovery from the pandemic is another key area of focus for the Executive's Task Force and will be focused on progressing an economic, health and societal recovery, which has the citizen at its centre. Any recovery work will, uh, will complement the longer-term programme for Government, which is currently being developed. Central to our recovery from COVID-19 is the vaccination programme. And while we have significant progress over recent work weeks, it will take some months for this programme to be fully rolled out. We want to recognise the dedication and commitment of the teams implementing the programme and thank them for it. We recognise huge sacrifices are being made by many to protect lives and our health service, and we're also very thankful to you all. We must continue to protect each other by following three simple rules to stop the spread of the virus, to wash your hands, wear your face covering, and keep your distance. Okay, Paula Bradley, supplementary. Deputy First Minister, for our answer. Um, we, we know um, that whenever there are stricter um, regulations in place, com compliance is generally much better. We know that from the figures. But looking forward, we are going to have to reopen the economy, as you would said there, at some stage. How do we continue with that messaging to ensure that people do not fall back on the old habits that we have seen over the months leading up to Christmas that ended up in the, in the situation that we ended up at Christmas time? So I think you're right, the challenge is going to be we'll be back in the position that we were um, certainly moving through the summer months where we tried to transition back into allowing some things to open up. But clearly well, that's not the space we're in today. As of today, we're still in a very, very difficult position. Um, we've seen the, the, what, what's um, happened in our hospitals over the weekend, um, clearly increased numbers um, again today. So I think that our challenge as an executive is going to be this. It's going to be how do we... Um, continue on with the public health message, get as many people vaccinated as possible, but then provide a pathway to recovery. And if you remember, the member might remember last year, we published a document that actually set out sort of staging posts of when we thought we could maybe reverse out of some of the restrictions. We hope to be able to get to that point again in, in the coming weeks to allow us to communicate to the public this is what recovery could look like. But at the same time, in, in a dual, in a tandem way, we need to have also the restrictions still in place. Last week, the executive um, ha has discussed um, the current restrictions, deemed them to be necessary for a further period of time. Um, the health minister also pointed to the fact that they may be uh, necessary even further beyond uh, the period that we outlined, so perhaps even up as far as Easter. We said that to give people forewarning. However, um, we won't keep restrictions in place for longer than necessary. But um, as of today, we're still in a desperate situation. As of today, we need the public to work with us, and we hope that. Um, over the course of the number of weeks, we will be able to publish a pathway to recovery. Uh, call Tom Buchanan, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her response so far. But I am sure, like the rest of us over the weekend, so I have heard the, the disgraceful comments of Michal Martin, uh, who uh, made reference to the COVID testing in Northern Ireland not covering the new strains of the virus, which we know was totally untrue. But in light of that, what discussions has taken place with the Southern Government in relation to the continual disgraceful refusal to share data with the Health Minister and his department in relation to those travelling into Northern Ireland through, through the South, uh, which must be of huge concern to the Executive, given that the Southern Government is struggling so much with their vaccinating and uh, testing programmes? I think uh, a number of things I would say there. I mean, I think the approach to travel here could be much better. I mean, I think the issue in terms of this is my own personal view in terms of the issue of travel, but I think that um, in terms of the issue of travel locator forms, which you refer to, um, I spoke with the Taoiseach just actually uh, an hour ago. Um, we discussed his commentary at the weekend. Um, I'm hopeful there's going to be a resolution to the issue of the travel locator forms and that that data will be shared. I also say that there's a conversation underway um, both uh, in the South but also in Britain around uh, mandatory uh, quarantining in terms of people travelling in. I think that that's something that absolutely needs to be looked at. Um, so I look forward to the conversation at the Executive tomorrow where we hopefully can discuss this issue of travel again, but it's very clear that we need to have an all-island approach to travel, but a two-islands approach to travel actually is what I, I personally have um, called for. I think that's what we should be doing here because when it comes to issues in the north, whether that be when the two governments diverge, um, then the north, any issue in the north becomes an orange and green issue. Travel isn't an issue of that nature. This is an issue about dealing with a public health uh, pandemic and something that we need to respond to collectively across these islands. Well, Matthew O'Toole, supplementary. You, uh, m Mr. Speaker, um, uh, th the Minister mentioned in, in an earlier answer that the Executive would be looking at a plan in terms of easing restrictions or how you would get to easing restrictions. Shouldn't that also be a broader COVID recovery strategy that matches 
the economic uh, recovery. We haven't had that yet, frankly, for six months, and there's been failure from both the economy department and, I'm afraid, the finance uh, department on that, given the hundreds of millions of underspend we're now expecting. Will TU drive forward the production of a full COVID recovery plan that joins together the economy with the public health response? Well, just firstly, I would remind the, the, the member that he has a minister in the executive. This is a collective executive effort. Um, the executive as a whole has been discussing the issue of recovery, how we move forward. We now have this task force that's going to be focused on, on the four different elements, so whether that's strategic communications, whether that's recovery as a whole, and that's going to take all of our efforts, not just one department or indeed two departments' um, efforts. And I can assure you that uh, the Finance Minister has written to all ministers, including your own minister, to ask her to maybe bid for some of the money that's left and hopefully should be spent before the end of the year. It's certainly our collective will that all of the money will be spent to invest in people in what is the most challenging of times. I'll pass you in. Borda hagus pweka slashen ara as okta fragri and you thank the, the minister for her answers today. Um, I wonder could the minister outline for the assembly the work that has been undertaken uh, to date by the executive COVID task force group. Good. Thanks to the member for his um, question. I, I just briefly had touched on it that. Um, you know, given the extent of, of and the surge of this current sort of phase that we're in, um, we, we recognise that there was a need for a broader um, plan. So the, the task force has been established. I think it's a necessary step change in the executive's response to the evolving nature of the pandemic. Um, the task force itself is going to lead and coordinate the integrated programme of work and the response to and the recovery from, from uh, the pandemic. It's led by the interim hawks who has convened a strategic oversight board that also meets um, regularly. And as I said previously, there are four work streams, so protect um, and recovery, and then also adherence and strategic communications. And work on each of these areas is being led by the permanent secretaries of health, uh, economy, communities and justice, and the head of EIS, each of whom um, all sit on the strategic oversight board. So over the next sort of four to eight weeks, the task force priorities are going to include the ongoing focus on the vaccination programme, development of the pathway to recovery that I've spoken about that will provide a road out of the current restrictions. It's about looking at ways of increasing adherence to the public health guidance and regulations, and it's also about enhancing the executive strategic communications capacity, because it's really vitally important that we're reaching people right now in terms of what happens next. I call Rachel Woods. Um, can I ask the Deputy First Minister, um, she mentioned there about the plan for recovering from COVID and the document that was published last year. Is that what we're still operating on? Because that clearly didn't work whenever it was implemented last summer. The point I was making is that it was a useful tool in order to allow people to be able to chart in terms of a, um, a progress to take us out of the current restrictions and ease our way out. Because it's very clear there's going to be no big bang. We're not going to wake up one day and decide that um, the executive can release or relax all the restrictions. So the, the reference to the document that we had last, last year is merely a reference to say, here's what it would look like. And I think that's a communica communication tool also for the public because they need to be able to understand um, exactly what that looks like. And it's going to be very difficult. Um, and as we know in, in previous waves, whenever we come to reversing, it's always more difficult than whenever you're bringing restrictions in. And then each sector will, will fight their own case, which is, which is very natural. Um, you absolutely understand that. So our communication with sectors is going to be really, really important. But I do think, and we certainly think as an executive, that this is the way to go to try to communicate a bit better with the public. Moving on, I call Joanne Bunding. Question three, please. And I will ask Junior Minister Kearney to respond to this question. While the restrictions associated with COVID-19 have impacted on the scale and method of delivery of our programmes, we do not envisage any of our departmental strategies being delayed as a result of the financial pressures arising from COVID-19. Due to a combination of funding from the Department of Finance and budget reagements within the Executive Office, there have not been any unmet financial pressures arising from COVID-19 in the current financial year. The final budget for 2021 to 22 has not been finally determined, and our department continues to engage with the Department of Finance to ensure that all budgetary requirements 
for both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 are understood and addressed at the earliest opportunity. Supplementary, Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There are only 14 months left of this mandate and many priorities within NDNA. How will the Executive Office ensure that prioritisation is given to commitments that affect everybody, rather than items which could be viewed by some as niche? Well, I thank the member for her supplementary. Um, you are right to highlight the fact that we only have 14 months left and that it is essential that we attempt as an executive, as a power-sharing government, to address as many of the priorities that uh, affect us, particular uh, the challenges set out by NDNA. Uh, and the commitments contained within NDNA are in themselves, as you will appreciate, extremely challenging. Uh, we are mindful uh, that affordability within our constrained budget position uh, as is the executive, and it is an important consideration in terms of how we take forward the programme for government itself. So, work is taking place in relation to ensuring that by April we have a, a high level strategic programme uh, for government in place. The, the NDNA financial package announced set out funding for specific purposes, uh, including the support for language, cultural, and identity, and funds to support expression of identities and progress of cultural development, in addition to tackling social deprivation and paramilitarism. And it is intended that the NDNA Joint Board will identify the specific purposes for which the funding for those unique challenges uh, will be used. Uh, the member will also be aware that the Executive Office is responsible for uh, a broad cross-section of programmes, uh, good relations, communities in transition, urban villages, ethnic relations, international relations themselves, uh, as well as addressing the uh, extremely important issue of historical institutional abuse and also those who are victims of our, of our own conflict. That work continues apace uh, and uh, to date in this financial year all of the requirements arising from those programmes uh, of work have been met, and I am hopeful and confident that that will continue to be the case in the new financial year beginning April 2021. Thank you. And I call John O'Dowd. Thank and thank the Minister for his answers thus far. The Minister has touched on some of the points uh, I wish to raise with him. Could he go into uh, greater detail in terms of the areas of work uh, the Executive Office is carrying out? Uh, there, there is no doubt that in some areas uh, we would have wanted to have made much more progress, um, and, and some of our work has been fettered and delayed as a direct result of the pressures which have been brought about uh, by the health pandemic. And, and that is not specific only to TEO, but I think that it has adversely impacted on the efficiency and the target set by all of the departments within the executive. The executive's priority and focus, as the member will appreciate, has been on steering our health service and society through all of these challenging times and on supporting all of our people. And, and that will uh, be work which will, uh, in uh, the coming period, develop into COVID recovery, which will present new challenges as well. Despite that, we have uh, delivered on a number of important commitments. And for example, the health workers' pay dispute was immediately settled uh, when we restored our power sharing institutions uh, one year ago. We are on track to deliver the graduate entry medical school at McGee and the first cohort of 70 students due uh, to commence in September 21. A mental health action plan <coughs> excuse me, has been published. A feasibility study is being taken forward. Uh, for a potential high-speed uh, rail connection between Belfast, Dublin and Cork. Uh, work has been done to publish uh, the new ministerial and special advisor codes. Legislation has been introduced to reclassify housing associations to protect social and affordable housing supply and the delivery of homes who most need them. And as I mentioned uh, in my earlier response, the Historical Institutional Abuse Redress Board has been established, with payments being made to victims and survivors. 
Thank you. And I call Colin McGrath. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, child poverty is now at its highest level in years, with one in four children living in poverty here. And there was a commitment within NDNA to deliver an anti-poverty strategy. Could the minister detail to me uh, when this will be published and what plans are in place to implement this critical uh, uh, strategy to try and address poverty? Mawia has done called as Ockton Keshinakar, Guramayat. The member is quite right to underline the absolute critical importance of uh, that strategy being brought forward. It is a commitment under NDNA, but it reflects on the, the challenges within the society. We remain as a society within this region. Uh, exhibiting very, very high levels of social disadvantage deprivation uh, in terms of the, 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 uh, the working wage, the incomes that families can rely upon. They are less here in this region than they are across these islands. So work is being taken forward in relation to addressing uh, this particular priority. It's taking place at pace, and I'm confident that within the very near term we will, in fact, be bringing forward that strategy. And I, and I hope that it then provides the toolkit for us all to work together as members in this House and within our executive to ensure that this particular priority is absolutely and categorically addressed in the time ahead. I call Doug Beatty. Mr. Speaker, um, uh, thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. I, I guess we have we've all witnessed the unedifying uh, disagreement between the, the NIO uh, and the TEO in regards to the Troubles Permanent Disabil Disablement Payment Scheme. Rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, but I guess the question is, are we in solution mode with this? Um, and have TEO looked at asking the Secretary of State if the $150 million, which has been set aside for the Stormont House Agreement legacy mechanisms, uh, and regardless of the arguments about whether you want it or not, forget that, could actually be used to make sure that um, the uh, Justice Department has the money to make sure that gets up and running on time? I, th I thank the member for his question, and to answer the, uh, the preamble, I can assure you absolutely that this executive is very much in solution mode to addressing this particular issue. It is certainly a key priority within TEO. It has been addressed at our most recent executive meeting. Uh, the two First Ministers are directly in contact with our Finance Minister, who in turn has been attempting to ensure that the, uh, the financial deficit required is in fact addressed. I think the member will, will sympathise with and understand that uh, we will not potentially have within our budget limits the capacity, the resource uh, to address this particular issue. That is why discussions remain extant uh, with the NIO on this particular point. I would say to the member that it has become an extremely frustrating process because I do not think, and I, and I think I am Re reflecting a, a general view held within TEO and probably within our, our broader executive. We are not satisfied with the degree of engagement from the British Secretary of State or the NIO in assisting us uh, to uh, identify from where we can uh, obtain the type of financial resource that is required to ensure that we can deliver on the commitment for victims' payments. I call Dolores Kelly and you may not get a supplementary. Thank you. Uh, question 5, please, Minister. The First Minister and I have asked for a review to the, or of the Commission for Victims and Survivors to be undertaken, and we are currently considering the terms of reference for this. We will review and uh, consider areas such as how the Commission's services should be delivered in the future, and what structure is also best suited for um, to be delivering responsive, focused, efficient and quality services. In tandem, our officials are currently preparing the comprehensive documentation required to begin the recruitment process for a new, victims, uh, new Commissioner for Victims and Survivors. This will be submitted to us for consideration by uh, the end of January um, and to allow us to progress to the next stage of the recruitment exercise. In the meantime, we will also uh, recognise that continuity is important for victims and survivors, and so we have ensured that interim arrangements are in place within the Commission to allow the provision of continued support for victims and survivors. The Victims and Survivors Service will also continue to deliver its services um, to the victims and survivors, which are obviously tailored um, to the individual needs. That ends questions. Uh, time for the list of questions, unfortunately. And, uh, we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call on Mark Durkin. 
three weeks ago, almost three weeks ago, at the ad hoc committee, when I raised the plight of our students with the first and deputy first ministers, both gave this assembly an assurance that they would work with the economy minister and executive colleagues to ensure our students are supported. Can the ministers please give this house an update on what discussions have taken place since around students and what decisions, if any, have been made? Thanks to the member for his question, and he'll remember from that um, ad hoc committee I'd responded to him and said that I fully supported the need for us to support our students who found themselves in a very difficult uh, situation this year, not least because they've paid tuition fees and they're not there in person. They've committed themselves to uh, rent agreements and then they're not able to, to be there either. So um, I listen very carefully with students and engage with them on an ongoing basis. One of the things that the executive actually has discussed are what can, else can we do to support students, uh, particularly before the end of the financial year when we have some extra resource. So we look forward to that uh, conversation continuing, but um, certainly uh, I don't think anybody is uh, dismissing the fact that we need to support our students right now. Supplementary, Mark Durgan. I to thank the Minister for her answer and welcome her support, but we'd, we'd really more, our students would really love to be in a position to, to welcome action from the Executive at this stage. The Deputy First Minister in particular will know of the vital role that our student nurses and midwives are playing supporting our struggling health service in the battle against COVID, yet they are not getting paid for it. The Health Minister previously justified this to me as being a UK-wide position, but the Nursing and Midwifery Council has reintroduced paid clinical placements for student nurses in England. Will the Executive look at this again and pay our student nurses for their invaluable, priceless work? Again, the member might be aware that I am on the public record of saying that the, public, that the health department should pay student nurses. Also, I believe that there are opportunities to pay nurses in their uh, final year clinical placement. So I think uh, that is something that I very much uh, urge the health minister to take on board. Again, huge financial conversations for the executive to be had over the course of the next number of uh, days, particularly as we uh, come towards the end of financial year. But certainly, uh, I am on record as I have not said that I believe that they should be paid, and I hope that there is a positive outcome for those student nurses who have been on the front line of the pandemic, who have been supporting uh, the health service uh, at a very, very trying time. Um, so I hope that there is a, there's a good outcome for them. I call Harry Harvey. Mr. Speaker, does the Deputy First Minister support the call from the supermarkets for a less full and less rigorous implementation of the protocol? to ensure food shelves remain full after the 1st of April. Thank you. I can uh, say to the member that uh, I support the protocol in its entirety being implemented, and that is also the role and responsibility of the executive. Um, that is an international agreement in terms of the withdrawal agreement, and the protocol provides protections for us. There, are some, um, there were some uh, teething issues in terms of food uh, over the course of uh, the uh, first early weeks in January, that has in the main been resolved, and that is something that I very much um, welcome. But we are also very clear in terms of the fact that the reason for that is because of the fact that the businesses in the British end were not ready to trade um, because of the lateness of the deal, um, and unfortunately, then they were not in the place that they should be. But I am glad to say there has been a lot of uh, resolution to, to, the, to the food supply issue. Harry Harvey, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Does the Deputy First Minister call on the European Commission to respond swiftly and substantially to the national government's efforts to agree new systems and not just grace periods? Thank you. Unfortunately, the outworkings of Brexit are being laid for, bare for all to see. Um, I said previously, in, as part of an answer to a previous question, that there are a number of issues that need to be resolved. They need to be resolved at both the EU and British government level. Uh, certainly, we will play our part in raising the issues that need to be ironed out. I am glad to see there have been solutions on some of those issues. Um, there are other issues that are still outstanding, uh, but hopefully we will see a resolution on them also. I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to thank the Deputy First Minister for the answers uh, to questions so far. Uh, Mr. Speaker, while I appreciate there will be an inquiry into the events that led to the death of Noah Donoghue on the 21st of June 2020, can the Deputy First Minister give a commitment that she, with the First Minister, will do all that is possible to ensure the Donoghue family finally get truth and the answers they deserve? Thank you. Can I say that uh, I, I have met with the Donoghue family, um, continue to engage with them, so have my full support uh, in terms of uh, getting truth and justice around what happened to Noah. 
I think any mummy in that position that Fiona's sitting in today and not having answers about what happened to our wee boy couldn't fail to be um, heartbroken and we'll all do and should do everything we can to make sure that um, every piece of information is un uh, uncovered and that Fiona has the answers that, sh that she needs to have. Supplementary, Daniel McCrossan. I thank the Deputy First Minister for the answer to the question and also for her commitment. Uh, the Noah Donoghue story has touched the hearts of our entire community. There has been a massive public support for the Donoghue family right across the north, and I too fully support them in uh, their uh, search for answers as to what happened, Noah. Last year, we held a minute silence in Straban, for example, and I know there was a large cavalcade that arrived at the gates of this institution just a few weeks ago calling for action. Does the Deputy First Minister agree that Noah's case is of such public interest among our constituents right across the North that it, must, uh, that it is important that we must show our support and intervene where possible to ensure this grieving family finally get the truth that they have campaigned for? And will the Deputy First Minister join with me in calling for anyone with information to come forward uh, and to help ease the pain on this family at present time? Thank you. Again, just because of the, the sensitivity of the issue, can I say um, all of our hearts break for Fiona Donoghue and the loss of her, of her wee baby boy. And I think that his, his loss certainly has touched everybody. So I think that uh, we all need to work together. I absolutely encourage anybody with information to please bring it forward um, to help the PSNI in their inquiry. Uh, I want to, Fiona to have, um, not that she'll ever find peace in terms of the, the loss of her baby, but certainly she needs to have all the answers and certainly we all need to do whatever we can to support both the family, uh, the PSNI in terms of the investigation, making sure that everything is uncovered and I hope that um, we get to a point at some stage in the near future where Fiona does get the answers that she's rightly seeking. I call Mr Paul Fui. Uh, we note the desperation of Micheál Martin with his commentary over the weekend, and given United Kingdom is a world leader in virus genoming, and Northern Ireland's per capita levels of SARS-CoV genoming is amongst the highest in the world, should we be offering our expertise to help the Irish Republic authorities who have much lower rates of genoming? So, firstly, um, let me say that yeah, yes, I think it's recognised that in terms of the, what happens in Britain in terms of the genome testing is some, somewhat advanced compared to other parts of, of the world. That's a, that's a good thing. But it's also um, clear that uh, we have more to do here in terms of our own uh, testing. Um, clearly, put some commentary that we've seen this morning from the various experts involved in the testing that's happening here uh, identify the need to expand our testing. I think that, and, and, and you, you weren't in the chamber um, when, when I raised this earlier, but I spoke to the Taoiseach before we come in uh, to question time today. Uh, he made it very clear that it wasn't about taking a swipe at anybody, but it was in recognition of the fact that there is an anomaly. The anomaly being that the, in the 26 counties in the south of Ireland, there is an identification that this new variant was far more, far more, spreading far more rapidly, and that didn't seem to be the case here. I think that is an anomaly that needs to be resolved. Clearly, we live on an island. The, the virus has spread in the same pattern the whole way through the pandemic. I can't see how the new variant is behaving any differently. Um, needless to say, what we need is proper identification of the new variant. We need to know where it is. We need to know how to deal with it. We need to know that, it's also, uh, that the, it will respond to the vaccine. And so tomorrow at the executive meeting, I hope that the health minister will be able to bring us up to date around where we're at uh, on this, because it's really, really important again, that we communicate that to the public, people understand where the current situation sits and that they can understand then exactly what um, health is doing to respond to that. Paul Frey, supplementary. Thank you, Mr uh, Speaker. And given what the Deputy First Minister has just outlined and given the tremendous rollout of vaccines in Northern Ireland com in comparison with the Republic of Ireland, uh, with their torturous delays in vaccines for its citizens, would the Deputy First Minister agree to me, with me that the Irish authorities should look towards the UK uh, with regards to support in this regard, rather than the EU, who have let them down quite badly? Again, it's my personal view, but I think that we'd be in a far better situation today if, uh, across these two islands, there had been more cooperation from the very onset of this pandemic. I think it would have served all the people uh, much, much better. Uh, we have continually called for more cooperation. Uh, across the island, across the two islands. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we, uh, TEO has called for a, a meeting of the British Irish Council. I think that would be really, really important. Now is the time to have this conversation. If we're going to get to the stage where we can get the R rates down uh, again, then that's the time in which to act together collectively. And I would much prefer we did it across the two islands, particularly when it comes to the issue of travel. 
Trevor Lawrence not on his place, and I call Michelle McIlveen. Mr Speaker, and following on from the, the Deputy First Minister's comments in relation to cooperation, um, can uh, she outline how long and in what ways the Northern Ireland Executive has been engaging with the Irish Government to access the passenger locator forms of people entering the Irish Republic? Um, for, for some time. I don't know exactly the length of time, but certainly for some time. And it's really, really important that we have this information shared. I've made that point again with the Taoiseach. I've made it with every engagement which we've had. Um, both at Taoiseach to um, Joint First Minister level or indeed um, between the meetings with Health Ministers. I'm glad to say we're going to have a meeting. I believe it was a rescheduled meeting from last week. Uh, it's going to happen this week. And that will involve the Health Ministers across this island and, and then ourselves, um, Minister Simon Coveney and Brandon Lewis, again, where the issue of travel uh, will be discussed. Uh, the Taoiseach has indicated today that they believe that there is going to be a resolution to the, to the issue, and I hope that's the case. Supplementary, Michelle Magilvey. And Thank you. Um, does, does the Deputy First Minister share my concern that perhaps the reluctance of the Irish Government to share this is an indication that the system being used is, is, is maybe not being managed properly by the Irish authorities and obviously has the potential to have serious consequences for people living in Northern Ireland? Again, I'm going to say that I think that uh, the best approach to this would be on a north, south, east, west basis. I think that the issue of travel into here from, from Britain, an, an issue which the executive has grappled with on many of occasions, I think is, is another issue. This is not to be political about this, this issue. I think the best way we all could deal with it is actually to work together um, across the two islands. I, again, made that clear to the Taoiseach today. I think that it needs to be a political solution at a Taoiseach to Prime Minister level. And I think that's if we can get a political solution, then, then we all can walk uh, through that space. Nicole Robin Newton. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for her answers uh, so far. Do, does the Deputy First Minister share the outrage of uh, Unison members and indeed the general public at the politicalisation? of the arrival of the British military to actually support our doctors and nurses during this critical time? I think that um, certainly all trade unions have a legitimate right to ask questions on behalf of their members. They wouldn't be doing their job if, if, if they weren't. Um, their job is to question uh, working conditions and practices of their members in any scenario. But I think that the health minister, I mean, it's, this is well rehearsed, the health minister made a request for support um, staff and support from the British Ministry of Defence, and you know our priority the whole way through this has been to um, keep keep people safe and to save lives and protect the health service. So um, no measure was ruled out, but the health service made the request that has now been met, and that's a a, a matter of, of fact. Robin Newton, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister does she regard? the military that have arrived here in support of our doctors and nurses to be either unprofessional or inadequately trained? My only priority throughout um, all of the pandemic has been to save lives, keep people safe and protect the health service. We're in a hugely difficult position um, right now, so it's really, really important that we support the healthcare staff that are there day and daily, stretched to the limit, doing a great job on behalf of all of us who may at some stage need the health service, so I want to commend all the health service staff for the work that they are doing. I call Jerry Kelly. Would the Minister join me with, uh, to thank our health care staff for the enormous contribution they have made in protecting us through the pandemic, and would she agree that the executive should consider using some of the COVID uh, funding available as set out by the, the Finance Minister earlier to provide a thank you payment to health workers as a gesture? of our gratitude to them throughout this unprecedented health crisis. Yes, and again, just to, to share with the commentary around um, how amazing the healthcare staff have been throughout, in general terms, they're always amazing, but certainly throughout this pandemic, what they've had to do has just been immense, and the pressure that they're under must be immense, and none of us can even imagine being in that situation day and daily uh, in the circumstances in which they, they're having to work. So if there's a way for the executive to be able to pay uh, one of uh, thank you payment, then that's absolutely where we should um, be. This, I'm glad to say this is something that the executive will discuss. Um, certainly, the finance minister is urging uh, the Department of Health to come forward and bid for that, and I hope that we can get a positive um, resolution to, to that. Fortunately, the member, the time's up, um, and I'll ask members to take a raise for a moment or two to switch the tables.